In this video, I'm going to talk about why it's hard to learn how to program. This video is the first in a planned series of videos on beginner programmer tips and tricks. But before I get into the tips and tricks to help out new programmers, I first want to talk about why it's hard to learn how to program. Because if we understand the problem and the challenge facing us better, we'll be better able to deal with it. And wherever possible in this video and in this video series, I'll be backing up the points I'm making with evidence published in scientific journals. There's a lot of research that's been done on this topic, and we should really take advantage of this to help ourselves out. As a teacher, I often get questions or comments from students about how solving programming problems is difficult. So the students can understand core concepts like variables and loops, but they'll find it very hard to solve new problems using these concepts. So for example, they can study for a test and go through all the ideas they've learned okay. But when it comes time to take the test, they draw a blank and they don't know what to do when they're asked to solve a new problem. So first off, is programming hard to learn? Yes, it is. And not just for you, for most people. Failure rates in introductory computer programming courses are as high as 30 to 50%, which is extremely high. Often introductory computer programming courses are dreaded by students that just need to take the course as a requirement for some otherwise unrelated program. And it doesn't get any better for students that learn online with online courses and tutorials having a 90% attrition rate. So why is programming hard to learn? There isn't an easy answer. If there was an easy answer, we would have solved it already. There's actually a lot of reasons why learning to program is hard. And so we'll focus on some of the bigger reasons. First off, unlike math, sciences, and languages, coding generally isn't taught to students when they're children and as they grow up. If it is taught, it's generally not covered as extensively as these other topics. A survey showed that many countries don't have K-12 computer science education and in the countries that did have computer science education, it wasn't necessarily mandatory. And even in the countries that had mandatory computer science education, the programs were often too new to study their effectiveness. This is a bit of a problem because many students are learning programming for the first time or without the same sort of background exposure as they've likely had with other topics like math, sciences, and languages. In languages, we spend years learning building block concepts like words and sentences before we learn how to write essays. In math, we spend years learning building block concepts like addition and subtraction before learning algebra. But students enrolled in a Programming 101 course will often be learning building block concepts like variables, loops, and if statements for the first time ever. And then on top of this, students are expected to use these building block concepts they've just learned to solve new problems that they've never seen before. So with learning how to program, students often find themselves having to go from zero to 60. In education, there's a popular way to look at learning called Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy arranges types of skills in a pyramid with basic memorization skills at the bottom, applying and analyzing ideas in the middle of the pyramid, and creating new and original work at the top of the pyramid. And generally speaking, the skills at the top of the pyramid are more difficult than those at the bottom. Writing computer programs that solve new problems involves skills at the very top of Bloom's Taxonomy. We can't memorize facts or learn how to plug numbers into an equation to solve new programming problems. We need to create something new based on what we understand. And this is just a fundamentally more difficult thing to do. But that's not where the difficulty ends. Figuring out how to solve a problem conceptually is fundamentally hard, but expressing and describing that solution with code is also going to be hard. So let's say we have a list and we want to find the largest value in the list. We first need to figure out a solution to the problem, and we might come up with an algorithm like this. In step one, we assume that the first value in the list is the largest value. In step two, we check the next value in the list, and if it's larger than the largest value, we make it the new largest value. We would then repeat step two until all values have been checked, and then finally, we would print the largest value. This isn't easy to come up with, especially as problems get more difficult, but when we express a solution in a written natural language like this, it's usually a lot easier than when we go to express that same solution using code. With code, we need to understand how to use a series of new concepts like variables, types, functions, control structures like loops and if statements, all of which are not really necessary to understand and represent the solution to the problem in a more abstract way, like using natural languages. And programming languages are very unforgiving. It's not just that we need to understand loops and other ideas conceptually, we also need to conform to a very precise syntax when using them. Otherwise, our program will not work. 
even if our more abstract plan to solve the problem is correct. Scratch is a visual block-based programming language that was developed to help children learn programming concepts. Instead of typing code and making sure that individual symbols and characters are used correctly, students drag and drop blocks, which can do things like repeat a set of instructions the same way that a loop would do in a regular programming language. A big part of why Scratch works so well as a learning tool is that it effectively eliminates syntax errors by using blocks instead of text-based code. The expression of solutions to problems has been made easier for students. Some colleges and universities even teach Scratch in their Programming 101 courses because of this. So it's very easy to make mistakes when programming, but on top of this, when we do make a mistake, the feedback we get is often very difficult to understand. The compiler for most languages will provide very technically accurate error messages when we make mistakes, but the messages themselves are not intended to help beginners. So we'll get things like this, segmentation fault core dumped, or L value required as left operand of assignment, along with some numbers and maybe an error code. These errors can be difficult for experienced programmers to understand. So for new programmers, the feedback is much less helpful. And yet, there's a lot of evidence that tells us that feedback is absolutely critical for learning. Imagine trying to learn algebra or how to write essays without getting any helpful feedback to correct you when you make a mistake. So altogether, we have a situation where we're coming in with background knowledge that's relatively poorer than other subjects, we're solving new and difficult problems, and we're expressing those solutions with very unforgiving tools that give us poor feedback when we do make a mistake. This is brutal. Imagine trying to bake cookies for the first time, if you've never baked before or seen anyone else bake before, and you have no recipe for cookies, and the oven instructions are in a language you don't understand, and when you make a mistake, the person that tells you what you did wrong speaks a language you also don't understand. You would feel lost, and it wouldn't be your fault. And all of these problems actually cause another distinct problem, which is cognitive load. Our brains can only consider and think about so many things at the same time. And when we have so many different problems that we're trying to focus on at once, it can overwhelm our actual physical capability to solve any of these problems. And partially because programming is a new discipline, we're still really actively learning more about how to teach programming. For a long time, people thought that having great math skills was the key to learning how to program. And many people still think this. Colleges and universities will often list a math course as a prerequisite to their Programming 101 course. And yet recent research shows that natural language skills are actually much, much more important when it comes to learning how to program. Language aptitude was shown to far outweigh numeracy skills as a predictor of success at learning how to program. So unlike topics like English or math that have been taught for a long period of time, we're really still learning what's involved in learning how to program and how to go about it. The learning resources that are available today to learn how to program are absolutely incredible compared to the resources that were available 20 years ago. And that degree of improvement shows that we're still learning how to teach programming. So if you're feeling frustrated learning how to program, you should know that it's completely normal and it's completely expected given everything we've talked about in this video. The good news is that as much as we have evidence that programming is hard to learn, there is no evidence at all that there is a programmer gene that some people have and some people don't have. There is no evidence that some people just can't learn how to program. In future videos in this series, I'm going to talk about tips and tricks to help new programmers through some of these difficulties. And whenever possible, these tips and tricks will be based on evidence. Check out PortfolioCourses.com, where we'll help you build a portfolio that will impress employers.